Well, welcome to the final wrap up of our Inside Lane, your daily podcast around the World Athletics Championships. And uh, as usual, uh, as in the last 10 days, we'll be here with Dr. Ross Tucker and myself, uh, Mike Finch. And uh, we're going to do a final wrap up of uh, what has been an exciting, and I think we were talking about this just before we came on uh, line, uh, Ross, just a few moments ago, that uh, it has been an amazing event for us just to be part of these podcasts every single day because it really kind of has helped us get involved in the, in the track and field. And I know Ross has been doing a lot of research um, as we go through the events, but it has been not only dramatic, there's been some great stories that have, we've seen happening at the World Championships. So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the uh, at the finals last night, and it was certainly one of the best uh, nights of, of finals. Thank goodness there was more than two finals in one night, which was always nice to see. <laughs> um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the winners and losers from those World Championships, and not just the people that appeared on the podium, you know, also the people at the IAAF, how did they perform, the organizers themselves, and then lastly at the end we'll have a bit of a chat about the future of athletics based on what we saw at these World Championships, and of course the effect that um, Usain Bolt's uh, retirement will have on the sport, and maybe, you know, who knows, he might be back in two years' time, you, you mm. never know with these things, but we'll talk a little bit about that. So let's start off with uh, last night's finals. Uh, the first event on the track was one that, Ross, you talked a lot about yesterday, the women's 5,000. It turned out to be exactly as we predicted it, but it was still great to watch. Finally nailed a prediction. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it wasn't the most difficult one to predict, because there was only ever going to be one way for Ayana to try and win that medal. Mm. So, yes, yeah, it's not the greatest prediction ever, but given my record in these world champs, I'm, I'm running it all the way to the finish line. I'm claiming it. So... So we said on the podcast yesterday that Ayana comes in off the back of a spectacular 10,000 where, okay, she didn't get the world record, but for me... But let's, let's just take a step back just for those, to give you some context to this. So Ayana was the person that broke the world record in Rio last year yeah. on the first track day of the, world cha of the Rio Olympics mm -hmm. against all expectations, and then since then, we haven't seen her. She didn't run again, like literally until she stepped on the track for the 10K mm. a week ago here in London. Well, there in London. Mm. <laughs> We're not in London, folks. And some people have asked and we said... We wish we were. We wish we were, but we are not. We're in Cape Town. <laughs> However, if you'd like to fly us to Doha for the World Championships in two years' time, please feel free to uh, we've, send us a proposal. We've cleared our schedules. <laughs> uh, Ayana, so Ayana shows up at the 10K. No one knows what she's got in there. She's been apparently injured all year and so hasn't raced, and she just obliterated the field there. So it wasn't a world record, but in my opinion... That 10K in London was maybe even more spectacular because mm. she did the last five in 14.24. When she did the world record in Rio, the last 5K was 14.31. Mm. The, the reason it was slow is because the first 3K, they just basically jogged. So, so she clearly had the strength to try and do a similar thing in the five. Mm. And she was up against Abiri, who's a, a Kenyan 1,500-meter, 5,000-meter mm. runner. And mm. so... Abiri's got a 357-1500, she's super quick at the end. Mm. And so Ayana's only play was to try and run the legs off Abiri. So I, I called yesterday morning, I thought maybe the first two laps, three laps would be slow, mm. but then Ayana had to go. Mm. And of course, three laps in, she goes, she runs 65, mm. second lap. And for context, world record pace in the 5000 is 68 seconds a lap. Yeah. So when Ayana attacks with a 65 and yeah. follows it with a 66, and then she wheels off 4.68s. She's basically going under world record pace, front running mm. in a major final. Mm. Mm. And no one's gone with her except yeah. Abiri. I mean, that and gap opened up unbelievably boxes. between the two of them and the rest yeah. of the field. Yeah. yeah, one lap they had 20 meters, two laps it was 60. Yeah. By three laps they looked like they were an entire home straight yeah. ahead of the yeah. chasers. Yeah. And so, yeah, uh, yeah that, that was, it was a big play. And I read afterwards that Ayana... Well, Abiri covered the last 4K at a pace that would give her a 14.05 5K, and the world record's 14.11. Mm. So Ayana threw everything she had at her. But the closer they got to the bell, the more it looked like this was going to go one way. And, and then they went into the bell together at 300 meters. Abiri just mm. found a gear. I mean, what a shift. And Ayana's interesting because she's got no mm. gear. Mm. Um, you know, she ran the last 7K of the 10K, well, uh, the title she won, yeah. pretty close to the pace we saw her run mm. the 5K. Mm. But when the time came to, 
to shift. It's kind of, it kind, of, it's kind of reminiscent, uh, and uh, obviously this is a biased approach from us in South Africa, but very similar to the battles that we saw between Alana May and Gerard Tulu many years mm. ago, where Tulu was the big kicker at the end, and Alana May was the the runner that had to burn her off. And Dorota yeah. Tulu inevitably won a lot of them because she just had to hang on. Yeah. But I, what, one of the things I don't really understand is that surely at some point, even for Ubiri, who's chasing so hard, um, she is, she's obviously going to get tired as well. Yeah. I don't, you know, the difference between her, yes, she has the kick. Why is she able to kick even though her legs must must <laughs> be hurting? Yeah, that, so that's, that's a, I think, quite a complex physiological question. Mm. You, I mean, if you put them in, on the track and made them around 400, Oberi's winning that race. So she has more natural speed. So she has different muscle fibers. So that's it's, part of it. So it's, yeah. it's the fiber type, which is, which is in itself something related to the nervous system. It's mm. not, not independent of nerves. Mm. But then also within the muscles is, is metabolic activity that allows you to, to change intensities and mm. so forth. And you get some people that just have that ability to find a shift. Mm. And physiologically, you, it's difficult to measure that because... Yeah. I mean, we're talking two seconds in a 400 is the mm. difference between mm. shifting and not, you know. So it's very, it's a very small difference. But yeah. she had that. Uh, Gabriel Selassie used to have that when he ran the distances. Farah's obviously got it in the mm. in the in the distance races now. So, yeah, and and that's where it gets fascinating because some athletes have got the ability to run at a higher sustained pace, mm. and others can find variations yeah. in pace. Yeah. And then you get tactical battles where mm. you're trying to. Mm. exploit someone else's weakness and play to your strength and it's, it's very interesting it was, so that was an intriguing race it was and I, yeah. I, I if you looked at it if you if you have didn't watch it last night and i hope you did but if you if you didn't check it out on youtube um, mm. it, it it you can see the the look on Nabiri's face when she goes past ayana on that back straight and it's, it's almost like she's been chased by something mm. you know she's clearly giving it absolutely everything but initially ayana kind of is holding it a little bit yeah. and you think ayana's going to come back here but she you didn't in the end she ran away with it but there was a genuine fear on Abiri's face that she was she was going to get closed down. She was giving it absolutely everything, yeah. there's no doubt. Yeah. So pretty amazing to watch. Yeah. Women's 800, uh, Casta Semeni, a massive favourite going into the event. Um, obviously from a South African perspective, great news for us because it essentially elevates South Africa uh, right up to third on the actual uh, middle table, which uh, I think if we started these world championships, given the problems we've had with our federation here locally in South Africa, yeah. Um, to say that we're now third on the middle table behind the United States and Kenya, r remarkable, but so many was without a doubt that the big favourites improved it. Yeah, so this has been a world champs of upsets and shocks and surprises, mm -hmm. but in a world of upsets, there's one lighthouse of stability, and that's the women's 800. Yeah. Um, so many, after the 1500, you got the feeling maybe the fatigue, mm -hmm. maybe she was a little bit vulnerable, because even on the Diamond League circuit, she hasn't been winning by the same margins that she was going into 2016's Olympics. But again, she ran really the perfect race. She was given to some extent the perfect race by her competitors mm. because they just did the same thing that they've tried to do every single time. Mm. And she's shown how easily she can win races like mm. that. So it was quick because Wilson and Neon Saba, who ended up in bronze and silver, I think they understood that, uh, well, I don't know, they obviously thought that their best strategy was to mm. go fast and try and run the kick off her. Mm. Which probably was the best strategy. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I wonder whether they should have tried something different because mm. I think before these world champs, Semenya was close to 2800s in a row unbeaten. Mm. And I would hazard a guess that every single one of those has been the same way, which is mm. Fast for 200, and then it settles down for the next 400, and then with 200 to go, Semenya finds the gear mm. that no one else has got, and she beats him by a second, mm. two seconds. Mm. Um, mm. And so we, you know that she can win that race, mm. off a fast pace. Mm. No one has yet tried anything different. So in my, it's easy to say this, but I, I, would, I would be interested to see if, if no one took the lead, and they jogged for 400 meters, and then suddenly someone tried to attack her, because mm. I'm, sh I'm sure she'd won anyway, mm. but at least they would have found mm. a different way to lose. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Because yesterday we saw just 27 something through 200. Mm. So Menya tucked in fourth or fifth, mm. 58 through 400, 57 for the leaders. So Semenya's probably 58. So, so, I mean, 57 going through halfway is quick. It's quick, yeah. yeah it's it's still quick. for men, men's time almost. Well, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's, two it's, seconds off, but. Not. Yeah, so it's quick, right? Yeah. Um, but that's the sort of pace that they get in a Diamond League mm. race where a pace setter does the job. So, mm. so Mania's just in a comfortable yeah. 
familiar situation. And then they went through 600, and then suddenly Semenya then is right there, mm. 100 to go. She's It's like you've hit the fast forward button on one athlete. Mm. So Semenya runs the last 200, I think, in 27.6 or yeah. something, which is yeah. absurdly fast. It means that her first lap is 58.6 and her second lap is 56.8 or something like that. A which negative is negative split. I which is that was mad. impossible. It's only, so negative split, by the way, means second half faster than first. Yeah. And that's only possible in a tactical race. Mm. When you look at the, at the world records for 800, they're never negative splits. I think I did an, uh, one, of the, one of the chapters in my PhD was actually an analysis of pacing mm. in real world competition. Mm. And in the 800, of all the world records, only two ever have been set with a negative split. Sure. And the last of those was in the 70s. Yeah. And so, Radisha, Sebastian Coe, Wilson Kipkita, you, you name the world record holder since then, it's always a first lap faster than a second lap. Same yeah. for the women. So, the, the, the best performance comes from slowing down at the end. That's just physiologically how it works. Yeah. Which goes against what people say, you should make sure you've got plenty in, this, in the from, tank for the second half. From right? 800 no. onwards, yes. Mm. So, 1500, mm. the best performance is even paced. Okay. Every single one of the 10,000 world records, bar one, mm. has been set with a faster last lap than any, or last kilometre. Okay. So then it's a different pattern. Yes. Point is, at 800, you don't speed up at the end, mm. but Semenya does. So what does that tell you? It tells you that that 155.17 is a tactical mm. underperformance, in, 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 in the sense that if she gets the pacing physiologically optimized she's going to be much quicker yeah so the question now is when does she break the world record yeah because she can that that performance yesterday to me tells you that she can run 151 152 Jeez. and the world record is 153 <laughs> so yeah. so so then the question and that is world record has been around for 30 years the oldest world record <laughs> in the sport yeah, yeah. Uh, 1983 yeah I think it was set mm. uh, I could be wrong on that so don't quote Kratzer yeah, yeah it's 153.28 right. yeah. I'm not wrong on that one. The date, I might be a little hazy. Yeah. But uh, so the question is, why does Semenya not go for that world record? And and that's where things get controversial because there's this there's this IWF policy which used to be in place. The Court of Arbitration then set it aside for two years. That that period of review is now over. Mm. And so at some point in the next four months, they will officially decide on that. Mm. If the Court of Arbitration confirms that that law can no longer be applied, mm. so many will break the world record afterwards. Okay. And just I to give you some context on that, what the IWF are trying to do is they're trying to, um, athletes that have a certain level of testosterone, yeah. if it's above a certain level, they have to reduce that medically right. um, in line with, uh, and, and the IWF have actually lost that case initially and now it's on review. Yeah, yeah, so they had a policy in place that you had to have a testosterone level below 10. 99% mm. of women are 3.1 and they set a limit at 10 for various reasons. You can look, look yeah. up those reasons. And since the court set that aside, Semenya has been unbeaten and Yon Saba has basically been second only ever to her yeah. by one race. And so, so that's, a, that's an ongoing debate. It's a, it's a problem that has no solution yeah. to satisfy everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can see both sides of it and yeah. the physiologist in me recognizes how powerful that testosterone effect is and mm. so I have I have a degree of sympathy for athletes who don't have that <laughs> hormonal advantage yeah yeah, yeah. I, I guess yeah. I did see and notice last night that there seems to be a, a bit of a shift around the way the crowd interacted with Cassa Semini I mean she was really on that podium at the end she was really lovely with the, the athletes mm. that are with her and, and she's got a very gentle demeanor and the crowd really cheered her when they introduced her at the start and then they cheered her finish as well so you, you kind of feel like the sentiment is moving a little bit towards her now you know people aren't looking yeah. at her as a sort of some sort of freak that, that, that she's been portrayed as in, in, in many areas yeah and that there's maybe some area of sympathy with her she's been massively i mean the the Casta Semenya story from 20 2009 onwards was it's just such a train wreck because mm. First, it gets outed in the media that she's having these tests done, and then it's accusations of she's a he and all mm -hmm. sorts of insensitive. Here in this country, the politicians were saying that people should just pull her jeans down and have a yeah. look. Oh, yeah. I yeah. cringed. I mean, 2009 was an absolute disaster. Yeah. Then the media got involved here, and they and they tried to portray her in 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 ways that she was clearly uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were magazine covers that just give you. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Dreadful. Not their best stuff. No. <laughs> and, yeah. 
And I think I think the fact that she's continued to run is in itself remarkable yeah. because that scrutiny would put most people off. Mm. Uh, she got some really bad advice initially. Mm. I think it seems now she's being advised a little bit better. Mm. Um, and she does. She's, she's got this. She's got this unbelievably warm smile, yeah. and she's extremely engaging. And mm. as you say, so, sometimes she gets a bit defiant, and mm. and then people bristle. But mm. I think she's won over a lot of people with yeah. her personality and her character. And same, the same goes for the others who've been accused of the same. I think yeah. there's an acceptance now. Mm. I don't necessarily think that it's right. Mm. Uh, and my, my, as I say, my position as a physiologist would be that I, I thought that policy was the best compromised an impossible position yeah. but yeah. this is what well, this is what we have and there's certainly mm -hmm. people have matured a little bit I think about yeah. this debate yeah absolutely yeah. Mm -hmm. right so final event uh, well not the final event but one of the other finals last night men's 1500 and um, we know that the Kenyans won it Elijah Manangai winning it uh, literally from the front along with his uh, his teammate first and second for Kenya but the real story was behind um, with the, uh, the Swedish athlete Inga Bretson who it, if you watch the replay, it looks like he gets in cr across in front of the uh, Spanish athlete Adele Michelle, and uh, it, in, in fact, post the race, he says, well, I didn't notice him, yeah. but if you watch the replay, yeah. he clearly notices him, and yeah. he looks up at the screen, sees he's coming on the inside, he moves across, mm. but Spain eventually decided not to appeal it. I was amazed that they didn't, yeah, because same, it looked very same. clear that he was blocking him. Yeah, so t there were two stories in the 1500. There were the two Kenyans at the front, and then there was the race for bronze. And the, the two Kenyans all year have been the best. They won a super fast Monaco race a few weeks back. And they clearly decided that they were going to do this 1500 their way, mm. which, is, which is impressive because it's difficult to run from the front the way that they did. But slow first lap, and then they ran 56, 56, and basically a 55. And no one lives with that pace. Yeah. So there they go, gold and silver sorted yeah. out, right? Um, meanwhile, the... the, the the guy who was challenging or followed their move initially was um, their teammate Kiprop. Yeah. But he screwed up because he tried to follow that. In the, in the first lap, if you watch the race, you'll see he goes right to the back. Yes. Which is stupid because afterwards, all three of them said that the plan was that they would go hard with three laps to go. But Kiprop never goes to the front. He always runs from the back. But, but if you know that your teammates are going to go hard and you put yourself immediately at about a two-second disadvantage, mm. the consequence was that when they went and ran a 56 second lap, he had to run a 54 something mm. just to catch up. Yeah. And that's, that's tough even for the best in the world to do. Yeah. So I think he hurt himself mm. on the second lap. I mean, he did his racing then. Mm. It, was just, mm. it, was, it was dumb. I mean, you know they're gonna go, so like, mm. pay attention. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's True. A, yeah. He ended up finishing ninth or something. He yeah, just he just, didn't, he just didn't have the legs and, and yeah. okay. He, he doesn't have the legs anyway. <laughs> Yeah. He's the skinniest runner I've ever seen. <laughs> that's true. That's, that's what you need as a runner. He's got yeah, the perfect true. legs. Yeah. But he, yeah. he's had a he's had an interrupted patchy season with injury and whatnot, and who knows what else. Mm -hmm. um, so so perhaps he was never going to medal. But mm -hmm. you can't run a fifty four in the middle of a, a fifteen hundred and then hope to have a leg, mm -hmm. have a kick at the end. Mm -hmm. So he gets passed up, and and the race then behind is the Norwegian Ingebrigtsen and the Spanish guy. Mm -hmm. And you know, watching it live with 80 to go, Ingebrigtsen is drifting into lane two. And yeah. I remember looking at TV and saying, you've got you to shut one down, shut one down. And he doesn't, he doesn't. And then suddenly he goes across again. Yeah. So he goes out of two and then back across. Yeah. But he, if you watch his eyes, he quite clearly looks right. up at the screen, sees because what's then, happening. Then the slow-mo replay from the front, he's glancing and glancing and glancing. Yeah. And meanwhile, he's, he's coming tight yeah. and tight and tight. Yeah. And eventually he gets a shove yes. at the finish line. And I saw some people saying that that Spanish athlete pushing him is the reason that they didn't appeal mm. because they were worried that a counter appeal would have had their guy disqualified but mm. so what yeah he fought he was I mean, fourth anyway. it's not like you get a, yeah. a, a bronze and a half yeah. you know yeah well, so he got he got away with it I mean there's no doubt he got away with it <laughs> yeah a, l a little bit a little bit I don't begrudge him the win because yeah. I think he was the third best guy yes. in the race yes. so good for him no issue but I was surprised I, I would have I would have been appealing that myself so well, let us know what you think if you watched the 1500 metres men final last night. It certainly was an interesting uh, final 50 metres. Right, so now we've finished, uh, what is it, 10 days of World Athletics Championships. And, uh, Ross, I guess the question is, the winners and losers of this event, who won? And I'm not talking just about the guys that got the medals. Who won from your, from your perspective? Yeah, so 
I mean, who? That's a vague question. Let's let's, let's be more specific. <laughs> well, they were, they, let's say, for example, so they were they were winners and they were losers. Yeah. Okay? And yeah. winners and losers. I would suspect you know we're talking about the, the fact that there were three guys who got gold and silver. Nobody did the double gold, even though we thought they, Ind- they were, individually, right? So, yeah. Tori Bowie would have won two goals. Yeah. One in a relay, one herself, and then. Phyllis Francis of the U.S. got 400 gold and four by 400 gold, mm. but no double individual, yeah. which is unusual. Normally, mm. there's one or two. So, because yeah. a lot of those double yeah. gold individual possibilities were quite strong. I mean, it wasn't that we were looking at something that people would say it's a new, you know, that, that, that at least one of them would have happened. I mean, Casa Semenya, Wade for Niekirk. Um, mm. I certainly thought the best one was going to be Mo Farah. He, he lost yeah. dominance in the ten. Yeah. Didn't got a silver again in the five. That was mm. a surprise. Mm. Um, so it, it was unusual that we didn't see it. Yeah. So so there's no single standout. So who got gold, silver? Was Wade for Nikak, Mo Farah, El mm. I think that's it. Yeah. And then you had a gold bronze from Skippers, mm-hmm. gold bronze from Semenya, and then a silver, silver from Tulu. Mm. So those were your multiple individual medal winners. So I suppose the gold silvers take it. So mm. the athletes of the games would be Farah for Nikak and El, uh, Elma Zayana, right? So yeah, yeah I wait for Nikak. Difficult double to do. So maybe Shay. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not. I'm not being biased or anything. Yeah. I, I was. I thought he was. Wait, wait, wait for Nikak is a 19.5 guy in mm. a 200, in my opinion, mm. because if you look at the two anchor points either side. He's got a 100 meter under 10, and mm. he's got a 400 basically at 43. Mm. That guy should be running 19.5. Mm. So in that sense, his 200 is a big underperformance. Yeah. But is that fatigue? I mean, is it inexperience or lack of maturity, and mm. by better I mean physical maturity and strength to mm. cope with it? Mm. So it'll be interesting to see where he goes next. Mm. But I, I guess the, 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 the big winner, okay, I'm... I'm Tap dancing around the answer. The big winner for me <laughs> like is a typical scientist. Yeah, the big winner. I'm, and I'm not. I don't want to be that guy. The big winner for me is unpredictability. This was right. the games where I can't remember as many events going against the favourites as went in, against them in this games. Um, and there's also unpredictability that leads you to realise that spo- this sport is truly global. Mm. More than any other sport, mm. there is a spread of nations that you can't find elsewhere. Mm. So. Just for example, and it's more on the men's side because the U.S. women are so good. Yeah. So the U.S. the U.S. suck a lot of medals away from other nations in the women's side, but not in the men's. So mm. l- let's do, let's go through the events. 100 meter USA, 110 hurdles Jamaica, 200 Turkey, 400 South Africa, 400 hurdles Norway, four, 800 France, 1500 Kenya, 3000 steeplechase Kenya. So that's your first duplicate, and we nearly finished. 5,000 Ethiopia, 10,000 Great Britain. So in all the track events, only one nation has got two goals. Yeah. That's cool. That's amazing. Then you go field yeah. events, long jump South Africa, so there's another duplicate. Yeah. Pole vault USA, so that's another one. But then you go triple jump and triple jump USA. Mm. But then you go high jump Bahrain. Mm. Uh, sorry, not but Qatar last night, Barshim, mm. Qatar. Mm. Uh, discus, Lithuania. Mm. Hammer throw, Poland. Javelin, Germany. Mm. And yeah. you get, so you get it's yeah, you see it's yeah. it's 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 cool because yeah. Yeah. you get this complete spread of of medals around mm. the world. You've yeah. got Ivory Coast winning two silver medals, mm. a nation that does very little else. Well, it doesn't have many tracks to run exactly. on. Exactly. Yeah. Yet there yeah. they are with two yeah. gold and plus a male finalist in the hundred mm. as well. You know, you get Botswana putting two mm. guys in the four hundred final. Okay, only one ran. Thanks, mm. IWF. Yeah. But <laughs> but two but two guys and and yeah, it's. Uh, so that, that for me is the best outcome of these games is that there's yeah, that globalization of sport. Yeah, well, I think that that's I mean that's what I'm taking from what you were saying is that you know if you look at sport in general and I know you work across many different sports including rugby where you have like probably five or six nations that really take it seriously mm. in athletics we can honestly say that that this potentially helps grow the sport amongst all those nations that did well. So if yeah, you've got yeah. 15 nations that have done well, including South Africa, there's no doubt that. South Africa finishing third on the middle table, just as our little country here, will encourage more athletes to be part of that process of being athletes because they exactly. look at a Wade for Kirk, they look at a Tulu and an and, and Ivory Coast mm. and think she can do it, we can do it. So yeah. it, it is a positive, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, women's triple jump, one of the highlights of the championships, yeah. because a head to head between a Colombian and a Venezuelan. Yes. And like, <laughs> that's, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, Cuba, Cuba's got 
half a dozen world class athletes in yeah. the field events and yeah. occasionally on the track. So yeah. it's yeah, it's yeah. it's awesome. Shot put, shot put New Zealand. That's the one I forgot. Apologies. Yeah. Just from a so. just from a sort of a, the hosts themselves, the um, mm. Great Britain and Northern Ireland as a team that probably a little bit underperforming in many ways. Um, but from an organisational perspective, seven hundred thousand tickets I think sold over the duration of the World Championships every night seemed to be very mm. very good in terms of crowd support. And I, I, my brother was actually there uh, for one of the nights, and he said it was incredible just being part yeah. of that. And I know we had our Deputy editor Lisa Nevitt there as well, and she was saying it was incredible just being in that stadium. It was like an Olympic Games on a final night. Yeah. So they did well in that respect, but on the track, probably not as good as they expected. Yeah, they were saved in the last two days by two medals last night in the four by fours, mm. and the gold medal in the four by one. Mm. So that that kind of mm. it's always good you finish strong, right? So <laughs> before that though, they had one gold from Farad and one silver, mm. and a host of fourth places. I don't know what the final tally was, but I think it, I think they got five fourth place finishes. Mm, mm. So so again, and the margins are tiny. So Mania beats Laura Muir by seven hundredths of a second. Yeah. That's a that's a bronze. So mm. in the end, GB will look at the medal count mm. as it's written on paper and say that's quite disappointing. We're putting mm. a lot of money behind these athletes, and they're not quite there. Yeah. But but the problem they've got, and we alluded to this in a previous episode is that in the past, Greg Rutherford, Mo Farah, Christine Harugu, Jess Ennis, they've had four or five superstars who are all either just retired or now are retiring. Mm. Mm. And so there's going to be a vacuum. Mm. And so, so the, the, the glass half full method would be to say, okay, we've lost the top of it. In other words, the cream of our coffee is gone, <laughs> but there's a lot of coffee underneath. Mm. We'd now, now the question is, how do, we, how do we turn them into medalists, those, those mm. fourth place finishers? So, they, I've, I've read a lot of the papers and so on from the UK, and they're concerned about funding cuts as a consequence of underperformance. That's right, because in the, in the UK, a yeah. lot of the funding comes from based on the performance of that particular sport right. at certain level events. So it's yeah. this classic high-performance catch-22 is, do you get funding because of success, or do you get success because the funding arrived? And mm. they, they're constantly trying to mm. figure out which side of the chicken and the egg they're on, you know? Mm. Um, so, yeah, so yeah I, I would hope that they would, they will, I mean, I know they do. Mm. They've got metrics to predict future performance. Mm. And having, I think, eight or nine top eights and mm. five top fours, mm. that's enough to say, okay, mm. they'll, they'll be okay yeah. if they can turn those medalists, uh, those non-medalists into medalists in future. So. And, it's, and it's important for the UK in particular to be really strong in track and field because mm. they really do sort of set the tone internationally just because they have the support. I mean, there, there is clearly a lot of support for track and field in the UK, based yeah. on the supporters that were there and the yeah. hype around the event, that the, many other countries don't have. Yeah, the re- a big a big reason for that, and again, you never know how much of this you're being marketed to, mm. is like in 2012, they had Super Saturday, where mm. on one Saturday night, Ennis won gold in the heptathlon, Rutherford in the long jump, Farrah in the 10. And they, and they had a five-year anniversary for that now mm. in these World Champs. Their slogan was, be the next, right, I think, for these yeah. World Champs. Yeah. So they're, they're obviously trying hard to leverage success into popularity, which is how you should do it. Mm. If, we, if we did the same in this country, it, by 2021, we'll have 12 medals. Mm. But the thing is, we won't, because we have a dysfunctional federation. Mm. Mm. So, so the problem we've got is that in four or five years, when Fonica, Ximena, and Manyonga mm. retire, mm. have we turned their success into next yeah. generation? So, yeah. so the US... Uh, the, GB are finding the same. Another country that would be in this list of disappointed is Jamaica. Terrible yeah. performances. Yeah. Like they got not a single medal in the women's hundred. Only only bolts bronze in the one hundred. It's the mm. only sprint medal they got. Yeah, which is extraordinary. Yeah. They got the hurdles gold. Yeah. Obviously, they they had two relay teams not finish because of hamstring pulls. Mm. Bolt being one of them. Yeah. So for a country that has won just about everything in the sprints for the last ten years. Mm. Yeah. That's a, that's terrible. So they're finding now that life after Bolt and Blake and so on, Powell, mm. it's going to look... I, I saw an interesting story in The Guardian, um, and I, I must congratulate The Guardian newspaper in the UK because I think their coverage of the World Champs has probably been the best of all the, mm. of all the places that we've been watching this event. It really has been outstanding. So well done to the team from The Guardian. Um, but one of the things they had on there was... Um, was talking a little bit about Johan Blake saying that you know they they were concerned about the future of Jamaican sprinting based on what had happened in these World Championships, um, and that they re- that even though he sees him as he's the next bolt in terms of Jamaican, he's not really there where Jamaica was, 
um, and they've got to now figure out what the next step is to find another bolt to in many ways. Yeah, exactly, and that's not that's not a no, one year no project. Process. That's not a one year project. Yeah. I mean, and that's what we've discovered in this country is, I've always felt it takes three generations to, mm. to, to you know, it takes one generation to screw it up, yeah. and three generations to find the next guy because. Generation number one is the one where you're failing and you realize you've got to change. Yeah. Then two is where you make all the mistakes that cost yeah. you, and three is where you fix them. Yeah. And so it's gonna, it's, it, may, it may well be a long way back. But mm. again, the Jamaican school system is so good, yeah. and it is their main sporting event, that school's champions. Because they have everything. They, essentially, they should be producing these champions over mm. and over again because they yeah. do have the structure yeah. and the support and the, the heroes to, to, to look up to. Exactly. So, yeah. so, so everything is there. Yeah. So they'll be disappointed but perhaps not too put off yeah they shouldn't be they shouldn't be too hopeless yeah, yeah. i think they've still got possibilities yeah uh i guess ethiopia would be a little bit disappointed they won the men's five which helps mm. and they won the women's 10 but yeah. but you know they still were not the dominant force they used to be yeah and significantly behind kenya now yeah. In, yeah. in terms of the, the medal table and the winning of of those big prestigious events men and women yeah. um Kenya would generally be happy. They're second overall on the medal table. Yeah. But they will be unhappy with their steeplechase. They got one medal in, in, uh, <laughs> in all three, in in both. I think the USA, in fact, got more medals than Kenya in the steeples. Mm. Didn't they get two medals in the men's steeplechase? No, just the one. Oh, the one yes, they won right, it. Yes, so they got right. the medal. Yes. But then it went uh, yeah. Morocco, yeah. USA. Yeah. And then of course USA won two in the women's steeple. Probably the biggest surprise of the championships. Yeah. So yeah, so Kenny will be that's their event and yeah. they'll be disappointed there, you know. Yeah. Here's another winner for you. Hero the Hedgehog. Yeah, here is here has done well <laughs> off these championships. I'm He's still absolutely. partial to Berlino. Well, I tell you what, yesterday, <laughs> if you if you manage to get online, there must be a, a the video that they showed before the, the evening yeah. fun, evening events last night. They showed a highlight package of, of Hero the Hedgehog, who was the mascot for the world champs, and I was hysterical. I mean, yeah. it, it really was brilliant. And I know it sounds like it's sort of a bit off the off piece in terms of athletics, but it's amazing how these small things really help engender the, yeah. and get the crowd involved. I mean, yeah, it's really good. And apparently, he's a prof he's a professional. He's an American guy that they brought in, yeah. and he's one of the best in the world at this. So these at, guys make a living. Being a mascot. At being a mascot. But yeah. like. You've got to know how to dance, you've got to you know how to be, be funny. You've know, got to be a hell of an athletic. Yeah. Yeah. There, was a, there was a mascot called Cooley, who was a cow in, in Switzerland. Yeah. I think, I forget the city, but it was a European championship, so now Cooley. Yeah. And the guy was a world-class decathlete, yes. and, he, and he was pole vaulting in the suit. Yes. In, and he was dressed as a giant cow, yes. and he was pole vaulting 450 or something yes. in a suit. I mean, <laughs> these, are, these are good athletes, actually. They're, yeah. they're impressive. They're a bit like the stig of athletics in many ways. There should be a mascot. Yeah. <laughs> triathlon at World Athletics, like a 100, a pole vault, and a, yes. a field yeah. event of some yeah. sort of javelin yeah. throw or something. For all we'll, the we'll, tr we'll try and find the highlights um, of Hero the Hedgehog, and we'll try and put it online as soon as we've done this, because mm -hmm. it really is worth watching, and it shows you uh, how amazing these guys really are. They aren't just uh, a fluff on the side, they really do an amazing job. Final question, um, after this 10 days of, of, of World Champs, looking at what's happened, what does the future of athletics look like globally now that Bolt is... So he's leaving us at the moment. We've been talking about the fact that we'll see you in a year's time if he decides to come back. But let's take, for instance, he is leaving the sport. What does yeah. the future of the sport look like in the next 18 months to two years before Doha? Yeah. The future of the sport is that the IAAF should call us <laughs> and have this Inside Lane podcast before and after every single athletics meeting and just fly us around the world. I don't think, so I don't think they like us that much. You know, I'm sure they don't. Let's just have a, let's just, sure just just look at a little bit about the IWF. I know we're sort of digressing yeah. a bit here, but I would say one of the losers is the IWF did, did make some mistakes during the World Championships they probably weren't really happy with. Yeah, there was, a, there was a constant sort of subplot to these World Champs yeah. where whether it was doping or administration, organisation, how they handled the, the, the gastroenteritis outbreak in Makwala. Mm -hmm. They were under pressure for a lot of these world champs. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I think the organization and the on-track performance probably saved them a little bit from, mm -hmm. from the, the criticisms. But mm -hmm. they are an organization under pressure, and mm -hmm. they're losing their, their biggest name now, mm -hmm. um, which, which I don't think, to repeat something I've said before, I don't think is, is that bad. I, mm -hmm. I sometimes wonder whether... 
And again, I'm sorry if you're regular listeners and you've heard this analogy a few times. Blame Mike, he brought it up. But <laughs> if, if, if track and field was a, was a, what did you call it, a tent pole business? A tent pole business. It's actually from a story from The Guardian. Yeah. The Guardian, yeah. So yeah. it's a credit there. But yeah. a tent pole business set up around Usain Bolt. Imagine going to the circus, another tent pole business, and the only thing you can see is the lion, yeah. the lion tamer. Yeah. And it means that you, you miss the acrobat and the sword eater and the clowns and the trapeze artists yeah. and everyone else, you know? Yeah. A track and field is, is more than Bolt, yeah. but you see how much of the spotlight he was taking. And hopefully, if, if it was me now, I'd be trying to leverage the diversity of the sport more yeah. than the single draw card that they previously had. That's, yeah. that's where they've got to go. Um, the doping stuff won't go away. Mm. I mean, this, these, these track and field championships started with a previously convicted doper winning the 100, which for the IAAF must have been yeah. an absolute disaster. Talk about a lit. false start, yeah. right? Yeah. Then Ayana wins the 10,000, and there's so much skepticism around athletes who disappear for months in Ethiopia and then come and win. Mm. And then Farah wins the other 10, which for the locals is a big deal and great story, but this is a guy who's got two coaches under police FBI investigation and is yeah. very difficult to trust. Whether yeah. he's doping or not, I don't know, but trustworthy wise, he's mm. pretty yeah. low. Yeah. So, so those, those stories punctuate the first weekend. Mm. Mm. The IWF would be relieved that the focus shifted a little bit later onto performances and so on, mm. <laughs> and viruses and whatnot. Mm. Even that's better than the doping. Yeah. But that's not going to go away. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The yeah. doping story is, is not going anywhere. And Seb Coe said before the championship started that doping's not the biggest problem. Mm. Relevance and credibility are. Mm. Doping is, is linked to credibility. Mm. So I can't see how those two things yeah. exist separately. So they've, they've got to do more in that regard. Yeah. Even at these World Champs, you had these athletes competing as, under a neutral flag. Mm. They're, all, they're all from Russia. Yeah. They're wearing the kit yeah. of Russia. Yeah. They're listed on the medal table yeah. as A and A, which is authorized neutral athletes, mm. but it's Russia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. have you solved? At one point, A and A was ahead of GB on the medal yeah. table. So yeah. that's that's <laughs> Russia. So have you have you solved the problem? Usain Bolt is asked a question at a doping conference, and they shut it down. Mm. And there's an article in the Daily Mail yesterday about how that, and I don't fully agree with it because you can't expect an athlete to implicate himself mm. <laughs> when mm. he's asked about doping in the sport. Yeah. But the point is that there still is not mm. enough appetite to mm. discuss it. And so that makes me nervous that it's not going to go anywhere. It's just yeah. going to yeah. um, morph, shed its skin and come back as something else. You know? yeah. Yeah. Food for thought, uh, Dr. Ross Tucker, uh, ath athletics analyst, sports scientist and <laughs> Track and field nuts, uh, thank you very much for your time over the last yes, 10 sure. days. It's been absolutely amazing having you with us. Yeah, and you. I mean, when we, Mike and I got the idea for this when we were watching the Tour de France. Yeah. So we need a similar yeah. daily thing yeah. on this. And I said to Mike, why don't we fancy it? And Mike was super keen. Yeah. So thank you. thanks yeah. to Runners World and, for, and to Mike for hosting us and putting <laughs> these on. And yeah. thanks to all of you for your... We've drunk a lot of coffee in the last we 10 have. days. Yes, yeah. Yeah. We could speak for an hour and a half per day on this stuff. Like, I drive home after these podcasts and I think like, shit, we didn't even talk about the, the marathon. We didn't talk about the decathlon. We didn't even touch on hammer throw yeah, and yeah, discus yeah. and pole vault and there's so yeah. much stuff we don't say. But for those who've listened to what we did, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you very much for your interaction on Twitter. It's been amazing. We've had some nice questions on our Facebook Live thing as well. And uh, thank you. If any, anybody wants to comment on any of it, certainly we'll be putting up the podcast a bit later on. Let us know what you mm. think. And hopefully we'll be back uh, maybe in Doha in 2019. Maybe we'll continue these uh, podcasts uh, during the <laughs> athletic season next year. Um, let us know if you'd like to hear more of them. So thank you very much, very Ross. Good. And uh, thank you very much to all of you. Bye for now. Till next time.